One thing I was taught is to never waste a sunrise. <laughs> My dad was a hard worker, so uh, kind of instilled in, into me the fact that when the sun come up, you should be up. If I get up at 7.30 in the morning, I just soon go back to bed because I missed it. The essence of the day is gone. If you start early and you work hard, it's going to be a good payoff. I have worked in the past at jobs I didn't really have much interest in, so I play now. When I get up at daybreak, it's playtime. Even though I've, I've got multiple speed records, I go out and I want to try something a little bit different, go a little bit faster, so the spark is still there to have fun at it. And as long as I can hang that carrot and it's still fun to chase, it's not work at all. It could be a 12, 14 hour day. I want to be on the range, I want to be ready to go. If I get up at seven o'clock, I'm burning daylight. Get some. I'm Jerry Michalak, multiple time world champion and world record holder. Both of my parents are from Texas. My dad was raised on a little 100 acre farm. He and uh, three brothers. And my mom uh, was raised also on a farm in Texas. So their work ethic is, you know, daylight to dark. Uh, 12 hour day is, is a short day. And uh, they kind of instilled that into me to, uh, to, to be productive. One of the big interests for me was shooting a revolver. Back when I was young, every police officer had a revolver on his hip. So when you saw a cop or a, or a police officer, he had a revolver. So also Bill Jordan, which was re really famous in the fast draw with police style firearms. And also Ed McGivern, who, had, who was a speed shooter. He was able to fire five rounds in 56 one hundredths of a second. And that just, when I read about it, it just, I wanted to do that. How could you do that? And, how could I achieve that standard? So the revolver was king back when I was a kid, and I wanted to get into that. Shooting to me is, is what I do. I get up in the morning, it's what I think about. When I go to bed, it's what I think about. Uh, it's an obsession. I've had the opportunity to shoot in over 20 different countries. I've been to Jordan doing shooting demonstrations. I've been to South America. I even shot a match in Russia, believe it or not, with a semi-automatic rifle. I've been around the world. I grew up in South Louisiana. The guns attracted me and outdoors did, so that's, that's what I did. I got hired on at a chemical plant in 1975, and I stayed there till I think it was 89, and that's when I used to work for a living. And eventually, it, Smith & Wesson noticed my performance. I never thought it would lead to where, where I'm sitting today. I hold six certified NRA speed shooting records, and I hope that legacy entices the next generation to get into the sport and give them something to shoot for. But to me, the, the best thing out of shooting is the family. Family first. One thing about South Louisiana, either you're standing on hard ground or you're standing in a swamp. And they had more swamp than hard ground. So when I was a kid, uh, I was able to get into the swamp really early. And there's more wildlife per square inch in a swamp than any, anything in universe. So it was a lot of fun just to be there. I really don't know how my mom put up with us. I was the middle of five boys, all boys. Two older than me, of course, and two younger. So I was right in the middle. I had a lot of hand-me-downs, but also had some uh, had some equipment I could borrow from the older brothers. It was it was it was a good deal. Being in a you know in a pack of boys like that uh, for me it was it was outdoors. Uh, the swamp was right there. We had boats, so uh, had some guns, BB guns, pellet guns. So I was always out in the woods hunting or fishing. And that's one thing about family pictures. Uh, if you have a picture of me, I would either have a in a hunting situation, have a gun or something. Or I'm out in the woods. Uh, that was about what I did, you know. Well, success is do, going after what you think you want to achieve in life. And success, I don't think you can ever achieve. So it's the, it's the fun of trying to, to follow you, not your passion. I shouldn't say passion, your interest. What gets you up in the morning? What gets you excited? And if you can combine both of those into a job, uh, sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing. I had a professional shooter tell me one time, he said the best way to, to mess up a good hobby is to make it your career. And you can, you can ruin it that way, but I always looked at it as a, an aspect of it. I can grow. There's always something new to, new to do, so I just kind of combined the two. 
You know, I can honestly say when I bought my first box of bullets and my first gun, I never thought I'd go from the swamp shooting in the dump to shaking a president's hand to being where I'm at today. Get some. The Jerry Mitchellick story is being brought to you by Hoppies. Hoppies, the gun care people since 1903. And Hornady. Accurate, deadly, dependable. I still have a lot of fun shooting a revolver, but the rifle has always been in the, in the back of me as one of the primary drivers of me getting into shooting. I guess in reality, the aspect of me becoming a professional shooter was growing more and more because of my dislike of being a mechanic. And it's not because I didn't enjoy the work, but I didn't, I didn't reap the rewards because you work in a gang. And that's kind of a, so you, had the, you, you, were, you were six mechanics on the job and you finished, well, you, six mechanics did the job. If you, you go out on a competition, and it's, it's due to you, Johnny, on the spot. So if you shine, you shine. If you don't, well, you're on the bottom. You can always come back and do better. And I noticed that as being a mechanic, I enjoyed the work, but I was stagnant in the, in, in the pay scale, and also the notoriety of achievement was not there. And you, you just if you're not interested in, in progressing, uh, you lose interest in it. And shooting was a never-ending aspect of a, a possible career and if you do good, you, you'll get the accolades and you're having fun. And it just, just it's the, it was like a natural direction, like a bug to a light. That's the way I went. <laughs> when I graduated uh, trade school in 1974, I had a couple of other jobs uh, being a machinist. And then I got hired on at a chemical plant in 1975. And I stayed there till I think it was 89. And that's when I used to work for a living. So now I have fun. When I would go on my drive to work, I had an old Smith & Wesson frame. It was a revolver that had gone through a fire. So I dismantled it, just had a frame. So I'd be clicking this thing, going to work, and I'm at work, working at 8, 10, what, 12 hours, 16. We, we, worked, we worked a lot of 16-hour days over there as a mechanic. And in South Louisiana, when it's 100 degrees, you work a 16-hour day, you're, you're pretty drained. So on the way home, I'd be snapping my revolver thinking about what I'm going to do, what I'm, what I'm going to achieve with the revolver. So it was a, it was a good, safe place to work as far as uh, benefits, but it, it had a limit, and I knew that revolver didn't. So it drove me to the next level. When I was working at the plant, uh, one of the fun things for me was Friday night, I was gone. My truck was packed, my car was packed, whatever I was driving at the time, full of guns and ammo. When I got out of there Friday, phew, I was gone until Monday morning. We always find, we're trying to find a competition. In the early days of competition, we shot for fun. I spent a lot of money getting there, a lot of time. I could have been working at the plant making good money, and I invested that time into shooting, which at that time, if I, if I went to a competition and want a bottle of gun oil, it might have cost me $2,000 to win two ounces of oil. One of the things about working on a full-time job, you, you have a very limited vacation time, and as I competed more, I needed more time away from work. And it got to a point to where I had to make a choice. I was competing well and doing well, and I had a full-time job. So the, the interest was, was starting to clash, and I had to make a decision. I had to go one way or the other. To me, that's what speed shooting is all about, the, the most you can do in a, in a compact period of time. So that element is still fascinating to me, and I think it can be improved upon greatly. Uh, and that's one of the things that keeps the speed shooting aspect so exciting for me, if you can do it in a 1.5, I know there's a 1.3 there, something in your, in your shooting technique or the equipment will allow you to get there. And that's the, the, idea, the idea of speed shooting is there's no perfect score. It's only better and better and better. I'm known for revolver shooting, but also in a lot of these competitions that I was going to and trying to compete with a revolver, you had to have a pistol. There was no way you can compete at that level. So I entered the pistol shooting game. And actually, the revolver shooting, if you can shoot a revolver good under stress, a pistol is a lot easier. So it's like a good training wheels to adapt to other platforms. So when you get the pistol in your hand, you're just gonna have a, a lot easier time on the range. What you want to realize is the very early matches when nothing like you see today, uh, they didn't even have the automated timers. We used to have a, 
uh, pieces, two pieces of aluminum and a stopwatch. You'd bang them together and the guy would start to watch and when you made the last shot on a stop plate, he would stop the watch. So there was a lot to be, <laughs> there was a lot to be learned in those first years, uh, safety-wise and uh, rules and competition uh, uh, forums and just the whole thing changed. It's totally different. In the early 70s, it was very disorganized, the sport of action shooting. So we got together with some friends, Gary Thibodeau, Barbara Thibodeau, Elliot Izan, and his wife Annette, uh, Chris Izan, uh, my little brother Donnie. We, we formed uh, the Cane Break Shooting Club in Thibodeau. So we could hold our own matches under, you know, rules that you could actually do some repeating and make it fair to everybody. And we held, uh, the Cane Break Club lasted about, I think, 10, 15 years. A lot of work to put on matches, but it was a, it was a good place to shoot and compete. And then the, we just kind of grew from there, a second chance, and we uh, sold your fortune. Anywhere there was a gun to be won or a dollar to be made, we tried to shoot and just, just kept going. Well, from going from a local match like we shot in Thibodeau uh, to like Soldier of Fortune, the size of the fish in the pond was changing, you know, so you had to adapt and you had to get better. These guys were on the, were on the mark. Some of these guys actually had good equipment. They had top-of-the-line semi-automatic pistols and holsters and all the, all the trick stuff, and we had revolvers, so to stay with them, we had to train harder and get smarter. When we started shooting matches that had international or national champions in it, shooting a revolver against a pistol was a hard thing to do well. And that's what actually got me noticed was I was winning speed competitions against the pistol guys and eventually it landed me a full-time job at Smith & Wesson. One of the aspects of being in a club now, we travel a lot, cane break shooters, we tried to make every match we could. That's when we got introduced to the Clark family. I started shooting with Jim Jr. And of course we all knew who Jim Sr. was. He was a legend. He was uh, one of the premier pistol smiths at the time. Uh, bullseye champion, had 71 career records. Having shot with Jim in 1979, I came across him again at, at some three-gun competition. And I, then I started venturing up into North Louisiana, and Jim and I actually shot some team events together at Soldier of Fortune. On one of my trips to North Louisiana to shoot with little Jim, I went into the shop, and there was this little lady back behind the counter with an apron on, and that was Jim's uh, sister, Kay. Kind of an interesting lady. That's my introduction to her. She was back in the shop working, uh, doing gunsmithing, and uh, kind of caught my eye. A lady likes guns. It's a good thing. <laughs> Not only was Kay a good gunsmith, come to find out she was also a high-power rifle champion. She won three state uh, ladies' high-power uh, silhouette championships. So her background in shooting was way better than mine when I showed up, so I was kind of envious. One of the things I noticed about Kay right off was how easy she was to get along with. Uh, her honesty is absolutely brutal. And that's, <laughs> and that's what I really appreciated about her. If she had something to say, it was, it was gonna be said. And I really liked that, there's no gray area. So we got to shoot a few matches together in a couple of years, you know, I had to marry the lady. She just shot too damn good. <laughs> One of the great things about marrying Kay, it was like a package deal. She had two wonderful kids, Zach and Justin. So it was just a family instantly. And then we added on Lena a few years later. That was a whole nother level of experience for me. Lena, she traveled with us from day one. When I saw her interest in it, uh, I wanted to help her pursue it, but that's one of those things as a father, if you try to make something happen, you know, the story about leading a horse to water, but you can't, yeah. So it was, it was, a, it was a very thin line between uh, wanting her to do it and letting her do it. And when she was able to shoot with girls her own age, it made the competitiveness come out of it. And it was, it was a good thing. You know, I'm really proud to have been a part of the Clark family. Uh, they brought a lot to me as a, as a professional shooter. And now that I'm well established, we have Lena. And I think she's gonna be able to carry on long, long after I'm gone. The, uh, the secret to any success in life is to put in a lot of hours. So if you wanna have success, you have to put the hours in and the dedication to always look at the next level. If you accept one level of a performance, you're gonna, you're gonna stay there. One thing great about shootout lane, I can eat, sleep, live it. I can go out night shoot, I can train in daytime, steel challenge, any, any situation I can possibly think of, I can duplicate it here on the range. And that range is also my home. <laughs> One of the great things about having your own place to train 
is I can go out and train. It's like a morning routine. I can go out for a couple of hours, and if I see what I need to get out of that, that training episode, I can stop it, come back in, reload ammunition, reboot, do what I need to do uh, during the heat of the day, and then go back in the evening when it's a little bit cooler. And if I'm training for a specific match, I have the luxury of tailoring my performance right to that niche, and that's what's great about living on a facility like this. This little shop I have here in, in that little bit of garage, uh, of course I can reload probably 60 different calibers, cast bullets for just about all of that. Uh, have enough lead on hand to do probably four million rounds. Uh, <laughs> a lay of the milling machine, a welding machine. So uh, all the tools it takes to keep all my equipment running and uh, keep me excited enough to be in here. So it's a lot of stuff in one little pile and that's what's fun of owning it. You know, you can come back here and just enjoy it. <laughs> my shop is organized in great detail. <laughs> This is, what, this is probably the one thing Kay and I do not get along with, is the way I organize my shop. She won't come into here without me to look for something, which is really good. But the way it's organized is, I know where everything is. It seems to be in a, in a randomness, but it's actually, it's, it's, in, it's in food groups, the way everything is stored. So if I need something, I know what food group it's gonna be in, and I go right to it. If I can go in here and, and daydream really quick, I've got some, 45 ball ammunition from 1917. I've got some 30 caliber match bullets from 1913 that I know exactly where they are. So I just go and it's just, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's like a retreat from reality. I can come back here and, and, and just pull stuff out and, and just relax and enjoy the moment with it, you know? That's the idea of having randomness in your, in your life is the, the, is the enjoyment of it. If you have a very structured life, you lose that spot that spontaneity of the, of the randomness and uh, gets pretty dull. <laughs> you know, it's been rumored that I used uh, substances to attain different levels of performances, but those substances were limited to uh, chocolate syrup, <laughs> Hershey's candy, uh, candy cigarettes, and wax lips. Other than that, <laughs> Now, one aspect of competition that I really didn't understand was the short twitch muscle and how to feed it. So we, we, I thought we'd be giving it a lot of sugar, a lot of chocolate syrup. <laughs> it might work out. So we tried that a little bit. I don't know if it worked or not, but it kind of gives you a mental edge that you might be going the right way. But in reality, the whole thing is it's a lot of training. And I, I actually came up with a routine of how to prep my trigger finger. And that's probably one of my best kept secrets I haven't shared with anybody. But I do come in here and I train, and I have, I have, I've never shown it to anybody. And I, I think I'm gonna take that to my grave with me. <laughs> the one thing common to all athletes who achieve is their vision skills. If you look at anybody in, in baseball, the way they see that ball coming in, even though it's at 90 miles an hour, they can see the stitches on it. A skeet shooter will see the edges of the skeet. A uh, professional speed shooter, his use of his vision skills and where to look is, is the hardest thing to actually uh, comprehend. When I was shooting my, on my bullet trap, I say, I spent hours and hours shooting rounds into that bullet trap and all of a sudden I had a vision moment. And once you have a vision moment, you can go back to it and then draw it back up when you need it. But until you experience it, it's just a concept. So you build yourself on moments a visual moment, then you have another visual moment, and then another one, another one, and then you can start to replicate them. And that's where the championship level performance comes in, is through vision skills that you acquire from multiple attempts. That's simple, but it's that hard. Between all the training that I do in this shop, this actually makes me who I am. This is, a, this is just a pile of reality that uh, I've accumulated in my 65 years of being on this planet. But every now and then I have to go on the range and actually shoot for a living. You know, when I was a young guy growing up in South Louisiana, everybody had a shotgun. As soon as you were old enough to be safe with a firearm, you had a shotgun. My dad bought me a 20 gauge single barrel 
Stevens, I think it was. I still have it in the corner. And uh, we shot a lot of shotguns. So as I got older and I got a pump gun to hunt ducks, we shot out of p rogs. A lot of this stuff, you stand in a little boat this wide and you're trying to shoot a duck left side, right side of the boat over your head, uh, getting a duck blind, you're trying to make all these shots. And uh, you actually learn how to improvise and you, and you overcome. If you, want to, if you want to be successful hunting, you have to realize uh, your platform is not going to be perfect. Your stance is not going to be perfect. So you have to get the gun to the bird and that's field shooting, you know. So when I came into competition, it was uh, it was an offshoot of actually hunting as much as we did. So a shotgun in your hand became natural, left shoulder, right shoulder, you had to do it. So you had fun doing it. It's all about competition. In 2016, we went to the Rock Castle shooting facility to shoot the Triticon World Championships, and we shot against the best. There was everything from bullseye, 22 rifle, sporting clays, five stand, there was action rifle, long range, just about any venue you could you could imagine with the firearm, we shot it. The whole key to a match like this is past experiences. Uh, how much time you spent on the range doing the other things that you're not comfortable with, or maybe not your specialty. So there again, exposure to different formats, different platforms, different caliber, different gauges. Uh, is this where the, that's where the championship is gonna be decided. Previous experience. What made the match very interesting to me was all the guns and ammunition is provided. So when you walked up to the stage of fire, you had to adapt instantly to what was presented to you. If you had a, you had a SIG pistol, you had a whatever shotgun, you had to pick it up and shoot it against the best. So you had to adapt instantly to what was provided. And that's the fun part of cross training. All the years that you've spent shooting all these competitions, it all comes to that moment when they hand you that gun and say, let's roll. One one zero six clean run. Okay. Ooh, survive. One of the things you want to realize at a championship, you don't have to win every stage to win the match. So survivability is everything. One of my big concerns going into the Trigicon tournament, I'm not really good at squeezing a trigger. So a small target far away with a with an unknown gun trigger, I'll get pretty I'll get pretty rough. So I have to just survive that kind of a event. Don't have to win it, but I have to survive it. Having competed since 1976, one thing I always tried to do was erase a memory of a championship. Okay, I want a, I want a world title, I want to erase it. I don't want to bring it with me to a match because then you have an expectation. And when you have an expectation of a performance, that's a huge anchor you got to pull to every stage. I want to go there like, hey, I want to shoot, I want to have fun, I've never shot this before. I have 3,700 championships or whatever behind me, or three championships, it doesn't matter. This is the most important thing right today is the shot I'm about to make. So if you burden yourself with an anchor and all these expectations of a performance, you'll never achieve it. You gotta go there with a blank slate and just apply yourself at the moment that you need to do it. For an action shooter to go into an aerial shotgun event like the five stand we shot, it's kind of a different aspect of reality because the gun never stops. And in action shooting, you're always shooting with a stop gun. So the follow through on a, on, a, on a lead or a swing isn't a natural thing for an action shooter. So having shot a sportsman team challenge for 20 something years, where you did a lot of aerial shooting and then hunting, all the hunting I did, it was, a, it was more natural for me to follow through and the hit count was better and I shot really well there. It was a big money match, so it, it drew in all the best talent. Might have not been the best three gunner, might have been the best shotgun shooter. So he's gonna come in and try to get out of his comfort zone and apply himself. And that's what really made the match so much fun, was you had to do well at every event. You don't have to win every event, but you have to be honest and stay with it and always stay with it till the last shot is fired. After three days of championship shooting, I was able to win the tournament, so I was really stoked about that. The shooting challenge champion is Jerry Michalek. When I started shooting, to give you an idea how old I am, 1976 was my first combat match, and we shot for a handshake. We shot in a local dump. That's the only place to shoot, so give you an idea how things have elevated. I never thought I'd be winning money, 
for having fun. <laughs> I think to a true competitor, he never looks at his past accomplishments. He's always looking for the future. And that's the drive of a perfect performance, which you'll never obtain. But in your heart, you want to have the perfect day. And you always strive to attain it. And you try to go to as many championships to have that perfect moment. One thing about me as a competitor, I started with the revolver, but I, I, I've got all this brain chatter going on, so I want to do something different, just like when I was a mechanic. And what I enjoyed about being a mechanic, I was a multi-craft mechanic. So if I had to go in and work on one piece of equipment every day, every day, you'd soon lose interest in it. And the same thing with shooting. To me, the aspect of shooting is, if it has a trigger on it, I want to, I want to play with it. I want to, I want to try to make this who I am at that moment. So it'd be a revolver, rifle, pistol, shotgun. I want to play with it. And you can, that's what's great about my job. I can do so many different styles of shooting. It's not just one dedicated bullseye or, or whatever. I can just pick it up and shoot a three gun. I go to bullseye. The level of complexity grows because you have three guns. I've got three bags of equipment. I can barely carry all the, all the stuff on the range. And that's another driving force is the, uh, the aspect of I have to stay really competitive with three different platforms over a broad spectrum of application and it keeps you, keeps you honest to the game, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> a lot of fun. So the flexibility of where I'm at it as a competitor is what drives me to trick shooting. When I first read about Ed McGivern, he was on a cover. This little stocky guy had a couple of revolvers and he was shooting really quick with it. And it kind of sparked an interest in, to, hey, you know, this guy can do this, and uh, so maybe we should train. And I, I got his book, Fast and Fancy Revolver Shooting, and we, we did exactly what he did. And it, and, uh, it really was right where I wanted to be at the time because it was, uh, it was really fast and it was exciting. He, he was doing all kind of exciting things. We actually were hanging upside down on the back of a pickup truck off the tailgate, shooting upside down. We shot out of windows. We shot left hand, right hand. Well, skip the can, you know, you throw a can on the ground and you shoot it and it bounces in the air and you shoot it, you know, and stuff like this. So it was endless combinations of, uh, of action speed shooting. And that, I mean, that's just right where we wanted to be. One of the things I always wanted to try was long range revolver shooting. That's something Ed McGivern did in the day. He was shooting metallic sided uh, 357 Magnums out to five, six, seven hundred yards. So Little Jim and I came up with the idea of shooting a nine millimeter at a thousand. And it's actually, uh, things have progressed a long ways from when Ed was a shooter. The quality of the ammunition, and of course, the firearms and the optics. So Jim and I got together and we did some good thousand yard uh, nine millimeter shooting. Roll call. That wasn't a hit, but it bounced right above my head somewhere. That's the phone, that was a hit. All right, Jim, it's starting to look better. Here we go. Impact, send another one. Impact, keep it up. Impact. It kind of simulated back when I was a kid with a BB gun, making a shot on a tin can at, at 10 yards, except we stretched it out a little bit. Same, same, same thrill. And that's what drives you as a shooter, just the thrill of accomplishing something, something new. Well, one thing about a YouTube channel is uh, you can do what you want on it. Uh, I have fun. I just get out different guns and just shoot them. I get, I get some input from uh, people that subscribe, of course, but most of the content is just random thoughts that we generate and uh, try, to, try to achieve on the range. That's a lot of flexibility. Pick up a different gun. What will it do? Let's, let's go shoot it fast and see what it'll do and how many targets we can shoot with it. So to me, it's just what I've been doing my whole life. Now I get to do it in front of a camera and share it with, uh, with an audience of like two and a half million people now, so it's a lot of fun. I would, I would say the need for speed is a great motivator. It motivates everything in the United States. It's motivated man from the very beginning. Uh, when I go out and shoot, if I have a shotgun and it holds seven rounds, first thing I want to see is how fast I can shoot those seven rounds. And then what can I do with it in that time span? How many targets? 
Uh, that's the way I've always figured my shooting was if I could draw and shoot a revolver, say, six rounds in a second, the next thing I want to do is shoot six targets with that revolver in a second. So I calibrate my speed to the target arrangement and what the gun will do. Some firearms only function so fast and some are endless, like a revolver, so it's kind of fun. One aspect of the YouTube channel, we do a lot of fast stuff, a lot of silly stuff. So we figured what would be the best thing you could do that with? Well, a 50 BMG semi-automatic rifle, of course. Uh, got one in, I never fired one before. Went out and did two cider rounds and went right into a six shot drill with it. And I was reading the owner's manual, you know, they don't recommend you shoulder fire it or something like that. And I'm going to, I'm, I don't have any experience with this. Let's see what happens. So we, we loaded up and went right into the drill. And I found out pretty much instantly from all the past ammunition that I fired, you could actually feel the gun cycle. You could feel the rhythm of the boat. You knew exactly when to pull the trigger. And it was actually a really good ride. Uh, the, gun, the gun timed out at about 1,700 splits, which is a real comfortable split for me. And it was really a fun experience because that thing is so brutal. I would say one of the most exciting experiences I've ever had on a YouTube channel, when I bolted on those two AR pistols to my hands, we shot the V-drill. And on the very first run, I saw it all. And I, I, I mean, anytime you do anything on the first run, visually, you get a high from it. So when I did it, it, it was just perfect timing. Everything went together and uh, it was a good experience. It was just, uh, that's why you do these kind of things. You get excited about uh, having a good run and then you want to invent another good run. My current venue now for competition has been three gun for the last, I don't know, 12, 14 years now. It's the primary thing that drives me on the range. So the three gun, of course, let me go into other avenues of, of, of firearms and still stay competitive. So I was able to keep my, my pistol shooting up. Of course, the rifle and shotgun is just all fun. Well, to prepare for a world record, of course, is a motivation of mine besides competition. Competition is one aspect of what I am, but the motivation to do something extra than what was required for me as a job aspect, and that comes out of wanting to do something different. Uh, it drove me to, uh, to explore the possibilities of maybe, hey, nobody's ever shot a eight-shot world record with a revolver. Smith had a new one coming out, figured it was time to do it, so we trained up for it and made a run at it. My first world record attempt was actually three at one time. And I had trained pretty hard trying to achieve these, these goals, but in actual practice, I had never achieved any one of them. So going into the, that was a, that was a hard one there. Go, going in, into the record attempt, knowing that I haven't had a chance to prove it on the range was very nerve wracking for me. And the aspect that there's gonna be a crowd there, they're gonna have a TV crew, and I gotta get up there and doing song and dance, and I hadn't danced yet. So the pressure was on, and I went into the performance not knowing that I could do it. In the heat of the day, it was like 104 degrees, and, and it was uh, it was brutal. It's kind of a steep learning curve. <laughs> One of the aspects of Ed McGivern that really intrigued me was his world record setting five shots in 45 one hundredths of a second. I think it was somewhere along in there, right under half a second. So to me, it was like, man, that's pretty quick. I want to do that. I want to get it on modern timer, and I want to see what, what I can do against his record. All right, you want to you want to film this one? Yes, sir. Shooter ready. Stand by. The actual record attempt turned out to be exactly what I wanted it to be. I was able to fire eight shots out of the 627 revolver in one second. A multiple target scenario where you shot two shots on each of four targets, and it was a 1.06 hundredths of a second. And the third one was fire a 625 revolver, six rounds. Reload it, get it back on target, and fire six more in under three seconds. That was a 299. So it worked out just, just right on that one. Everything worked out at the end. Even though it was a kind of a rough start, we got them all done, and uh, there they were. Three records, one day. And that'll entice the next generation to come up and try to beat it. So I know there's faster that's never touched the trigger yet, but right now, I'm there. So... <laughs> 
set the world record. I had three of them and I uh, wanted to do something different. This time I wanted to do it with a modern sporting rifle, an AR-15 style rifle. So I came up with an STL drill and this is kind of an offshoot of a military training sequence that we, that we came up with. And what I wanted to do was take it to the next level and make a world record out of it so guys could train on a military base or they could train on a range. The whole idea is like the old yo-yo guys who used to travel around the country doing all the yo-yo tricks. I was doing the same thing with a rifle. Set a standard and other guys try to achieve it. It gets more people into the sport. And to me, it's like sharing uh, your experiences. Uh, you set a standard, next guy come along, he'll break it, and then somebody else will train. And it just draws more attention to, uh, to having fun on the range. So you burn an ammo, you're being safe. That's what it's all about. Hey, one of the things about setting a goal of a world record is the amount of time you're going to put into it. It sounds really trick. I'm going to go out and do this. But, and, that, and the reality of it is uh, I had to set a practice time pretty often during the day. Uh, toward the end, I was shooting like twice a day. Go out and shoot 100 rounds cold. It's a difference. That's where the piles of ammunition come in. That was slow. Yeah, it was. I think one of the fun aspects of a world speed shooting attempt is the adrenaline dump. If you truly enjoy what you're doing, you're gonna get a you're gonna get an adrenaline dump. It's almost like a high. A lot of guys who've competed when they first step on the line, they get this adrenaline dump and their fingers are tingling and their knees shake. That's exactly where I wanna be. If I can get one of those when I'm doing a speed attempt, I'm gonna break the trigger off that thing. Uh, it's gonna be a good ride. I know it's gonna be because that's a gift. It's gonna be a fight or flight syndrome. And I'm going to use it as a positive. I'm going to channel it right through the finger. And if you got a crowd there cheering you on, it's going to be a really good experience. This is what we got today, uh, guys. We got a drill called the STL drill. It's a three target scenario. We're going to try to do it officially in under two seconds. So every 20 hundredths of a second, I got to be doing something pretty important. So you ready to go? Yeah. Shooter ready. Stand by. I'm getting ready to execute my first run. A uh, thousand distractions. Can't let that be a factor. Got to see everything, be everything, feel everything, and just be very attentive for that start and get the, get horsepower on the target, clip in, make it happen, start the trigger pull, and let it ride. One point six four seconds. Ten shots. Got a 1.64. So you want to go faster? Yeah. Woo! Stand by. 1.59 seconds. Oh! Oh! <laughs> World exhibition shooting record now held by Jerry Mitchellick is 1.5. 0.59 seconds. Yeah. And to me, it was pretty exciting. It was a good visual moment. Under pressure to be able to execute and do it. So I was pretty happy with that one. I hold six certified NRA speed shooting records, and I hope that legacy entices the next generation to get into the sport and give them something to shoot for. Get some. The Jerry Mitchell story has been brought to you by Hoppies. Hoppies the gun care people since 1903. And Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. You know, one of the exciting aspects of all this shooting that Kay and I have done, the championships, the training, and we're able to hand it off to Lena and she can carry on the legacy. Of course, when Lena came along, uh, she was exposed to shooting from the time she was born. So she was in more matches than <laughs> I was when I was 40 years old. Lena started shooting, I think, when she was five, six, seven years old. So she's had a gun in her hand for a long time. And probably one of the most proud moments I had as a father was when Lena was competing in a sportsman team challenge on the three girl team. And they gave them all a medal about this big. So she was that tall and she had that big medal hanging on her neck. And you can see by the grin on her face, she was having a lot of fun and that kind of set the hook in her. And she had the ability to train with Kay and I. So she just kept going and kept going. Now she, uh, she's a full-time shooter for SIG Arms. One of the fun things for me is shooting with family. 
Uh, I've shot enough matches alone that, that, you know, I've done that already. But shooting with everybody brings another level of uh, complexity. But to me, it's a lot more fun. We can interact. Kay has a good experience. I can feed off of it. Lena comes in, she's smiling. Oh, I just did really do it over there. And I, I, get, I get excited about it and I can exchange what I've done. So we kind of feed off of each other and it, it becomes a family. It's, it's, a, it's a good experience with everybody and uh, it can be a very positive experience. Well, that's the first time I've done that here. It I, I never shot. You shoot my ammo you too. Years that was my experience. ammo you shot. No. You're not supposed to beat me with my stuff. Just give this to me. Uh. Seeing my little one grow up and now even beating me at matches makes me proud. But if you're not playing and having fun, what's the point? From night shoots, blowing stuff up, to building a Franken gun. An idea is to stretch it tight as you can, of course. Right, would you like me to hold this since you're, you're extremely you're, you're, particular? You're more particular go. about this than any other gun you've ever built. 18. There you go. That's why we did that. The even getting out of my comfort zone in that cold white stuff, I've had a lot of fun showing Lena some of my tricks. Maybe the most fun is showing Lena the way I grew up and teaching her some of the things I've learned in the swamp. Hey! <laughs> Bottom line is that the most fun I've had is when we all get together and go head to head, pushing each other to go faster and faster. I was fast at that time. Okay, whatever <laughs> helps you sleep at night. I'm always faster than you are, especially early in the morning. Get ready. Stand by. Yo. It's turned into seeing a reflection of myself. Stand by. Nice. Oh. 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 And you know, guys, I just can't wait to see all the good things Lena is going to accomplish in the future. I hope I live that long. She's going to have a really good career. I guess shooting for me doesn't have an expiration date just as of yet. I've been shooting now for 30 years as a pro. I've got a YouTube channel. So what I'm trying to do is build the channel up and uh, eventually hand it over to Lena. Uh, to me, having the opportunity to uh, have shot with family as much as I have, it, that's what my main enjoyment, I would say, out of the, all the shooting accomplishments was, of course, meeting Kay and having Lena and Justin and Zach in my life. And uh, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a really good adventure. Shooting to me is, is what I do. I get up in the morning, it's what I think about. When I go to bed, it's what I think about. Uh, it's an obsession. I would like to have taken it further in my career. But to me, the, the best thing out of shooting is the family. Family first. One thing life has taught me is that you have, you have a sort of a direction of where you want to go. But the big thing is if you have to be standing by the door when it opens. Uh, so what that means, if you train, you, have, you really have passion for something and you go toward the light and uh, the door opens, well, there you are. The other aspect of life is you have to have the right people in your life. And I was very fortunate there to have that. Those people have allowed me to accomplish the things I've accomplished. All those millions of rounds and years and years of practice are thanks to them. They're the reason I get up and do this day after day. To be quite honest with you, I can't wait for the next sunrise. You get to do it all over again. <laughs>